Order members, order. We come to questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we will start with topical questions, which will last 15 minutes. And I call Ian Millen. In light of uh, Judge Tracy's judgment on Friday, uh, that said, Mr. Spitz's decision to ban blood donations from gay men is irrational and in breach of the ministerial code. What steps will the First Minister, as the DUP nominating officer, uh, take to, uh, on this matter? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, unlike a lot of the people who have been commenting on this issue, I've actually read the, the judgment and read it several times. He, of course, does not say that a decision uh, to uh, ban MSM blood uh, is irrational. He indicated that uh, the uh, irrationality came from uh, banning it in Northern Ireland but allowing a small quantity to come in from outside of Northern Ireland. That, of course, could be rectified if the Minister so chose. He had, however, two other grounds, uh, both of which uh, I, I think the Executive is going to have to look at on the constitutionality issue as to whether uh, there was a power for the Minister to take such a decision. I suspect, uh, no matter what the Department may ultimately decide whether they appeal or not, I suspect the Department of Health in Great Britain may well uh, appeal the issue because there are devolution issues uh, at stake here uh, as to whether the uh, powers that are given to the member country can be devolved uh, to uh, the devolved regions, which was assumed to be the, the case. And that's an issue quite separate that has to be considered. The other issue, of course, uh, which is in breach of the ministerial code, uh, these provisions were provisions that uh, were put in during the negotiations by my party. Uh, they have been discussed on a number of occasions uh, at executive meetings, and we have taken advice from time to time from the Attorney General. There has been a general view on the part of the executive that if we were to carry them to the level that uh, Mr Justice Tracy carried it to, that literally everything would come to the uh, executive. Uh, no spending decision, no individual decisions by minister could happen. They would all have to come to the executive uh, committee. And I think there are Mr. very Tyson, major difficulties uh, in doing that. Uh, and I think the executive is going to have to, to look at that issue uh, as well. But it is very clear anyway that any significant major decision that is taken that is controversial should come to the Executive Committee. But no member of the Executive Committee asked this to, for this to be discussed. Ian Miller, supplementary. Very good, uh, Ken Collier. And uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer uh, thus far. But uh, does the Minister accept Judge uh, Tracy's and agree with Judge Tracy's uh, ruling on this matter? Very good. You're trying to get me into to trouble. Uh, I, I think that those are obviously matters that can be uh, considered by uh, those from a, a legal background. Uh, if the department does not agree with it, then it can appeal that uh, judgment. In terms of the ministerial code, uh, I had been more uh, content and felt that uh, the Lord Chief Justice's ruling on that matter was a, a sensible uh, judgment in that. He indicated that if there was a controversial or significant matter, then it would be raised at the Executive Committee. That meant that only, if you like, the nuclear issues would start coming to the Executive rather than every single issue. Because if every single issue is brought to the, the Executive, then there is no minister in this House who will be able to take any decision on their own. They're all going to have to come through the Executive Committee. So before people start cheering to the, the rafters about this issue, they should think of the ramifications of the judgment. Uh, Joe Byrne. Mr. Thank Byrne. You, Mr. Speaker. Would the First Minister agree that the ongoing protest camp at Tredell Avenue is causing major concern in that neighbourhood? And what would the First Minister and indeed the Deputy First Minister jointly hope to do to try and resolve that situation for those neighbourhood people there? Well, of course there, there is disruption, I have, I have no doubt, to people uh, in the, the neighbourhood and I have no doubt that uh, it uh, puts a, additional uh, pressure on the PSNI of the additional work that they have to do. Uh, but we do defend in this country people's right to peacefully and lawfully uh, protest. And as long as protests are carried out peacefully and lawfully, then uh, those of us who are part of a democratic institution uh, should be uh, content uh, to, to support their, their right. Uh, in terms of what we are doing about it, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, brought in colleagues from the, the leaders of other parties 
We recognised that there were some outstanding issues in relation to parades and flags in the past that needed to be resolved. Uh, we therefore came to, together and they agreed that uh, Dr Richard Haas uh, should facilitate and chair uh, an all-party group that would look at those outstanding issues. And uh, those are the very issues that uh, are at the heart of the protest campaign at uh, Twadell. Uh, I urge everybody uh, to remember that uh, they have to uphold the rule of the law, uh, they have to cooperate with the PSNI, and they have to uh, abide uh, by the, the conditions that are laid down. Uh, but I, I do protect people's right uh, to, to protest, providing they do it lawfully and peacefully. Yeah. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Would the First Minister agree, however, that given that the Hacks Talks process has started, that the business community in Belfast are very concerned that there might be more protest parades in the city coming up to the festive season, and what words of encouragement could he give to people to make sure that protests do not end in disruption and cause havoc to the shopping community? Well, I, I would sympathise particularly with the traders in Belfast who had uh, a very bad uh, period around Christmas of, of, of last year. Uh, and when we talk about uh, rights, there are, of course, competing rights. There is the right of people to carry out their, their daily business, whether that is in businesses or whether it is going in to uh, carry out commercial activity in the centre of, of Belfast. Uh, and people carrying out uh, activities in terms of protests have to take into account uh, the, the rights of others and uh, of the, the wider society. Uh, I have heard of some proposals to, to hold protests leading up to the Christmas period. I hope people will reflect on the damage that, that would cause to Northern Ireland and to traders in Belfast, potentially leading to a loss of, of jobs. Uh, the, the protest in Twadell Avenue will not have that uh, impact, but certainly if uh, protests were brought into the centre of Belfast, it has that uh, possible outcome. George Robinson. Mr. Thank Robinson. you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the First, First Minister to give a, the House an update on the highly successful investment conference, conference held last week in Belfast? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the, the, the member has probably used the, the two words that uh, do sum it up, which is highly successful. Uh, of course, the ultimate success uh, is in outcomes. It's uh, in actually being able to tie down the, the, the jobs that would come to Northern Ireland and the level of investment that would come. Uh, both the, the Deputy First Minister and I have uh, been involved now in three investment conferences back in 2008. Then the Washington Investment Conference, uh, kindly organised uh, by the United States Administration under uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and then this one. Uh, and we are both agreed that uh, in terms of the contact that we have had with uh, investors, this is by far the most successful conference that, that we have had. Uh, the response was very positive from those that we spoke to, uh, both on the, the evening, the Friday evening, or the Thursday evening in uh, Hillsborough Castle uh, at the, the dinner. Uh, and some people, I, I noticed the BBC talking about whining and dining and so forth. I have to say that it is that kind of networking that really does get you a connection with business people. It is the opportunity for you to find out what projects various companies are looking at and therefore how we might fit into to, uh, their needs uh, uh, and requirements. Uh, and again, at that uh, dinner, we spoke to a number of people, both the Deputy First Minister at his table uh, and me at mine, uh, spoke to people who were looking at Northern Ireland as a possible place for investment. And the encouraging thing the next day was to find that a lot of those companies who had Northern Ireland on a shortlist were indicating that Northern Ireland had now leapfrogged to the top of their shortlist, uh, and that indicates how successful uh, the investment conference was. The Deputy First Minister and I went down to uh, invest Northern Ireland's offices this morning to thank the, the team who had worked so hard, uh, and we give uh, due recognition to Alistair Hamilton and his team uh, for the preparation and for the work that they carried out. Mr. Robinson. Good day. Thank uh, the First Minister for his answer. And uh, could I ask the Minister, during the course of the Prime Minister's visit, did the First Minister have an opportunity to raise the issue of much needed DBA jobs in Korean? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, yes, I, I, can, I gave a, an assurance when I was down uh, in Korean and met with the, the workers that I would raise it with the Prime Minister. And both the Deputy First Minister and I spoke to the Prime Minister about this uh, in the private meeting that we had with him. 
We presented him with an aid memoir, uh, which gave background details of the case, uh, and he has indicated that while there's presently uh, a consultation on, uh, he cannot obviously give any uh, definitive remarks, but will uh, make contact with us uh, closer to the time when a decision is being taken. Kim Kolya, uh, can I ask the First Minister what measures has OFM DFM in place to ensure the appropriate level of cooperation between the Victims and Survivors Service and the Victims Commissioner to ensure full compliance with all statutory requirements? <coughs> Well, I'm grateful for, for that question because I, I have noted, as no doubt uh, the, the member has, that there have been some remarks made more recently uh, on that subject. Uh, we have arranged within the department to, to bring together uh, the Victims Service and the Victims Commissioner with some of our own people, and we'll talk over those uh, issues, uh, and hopefully we will get them resolved. So action is already underway. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Um, can I ask, is, is the Department and Minister satisfied that the needs of victims and survivors will be acknowledged and addressed as a result of the measures adopted by the Department? Well, th these are the kind of issues that must always be constantly under review. Uh, none of us should be complacent on these uh, matters. If there are specific uh, issues that the Victims Commissioner uh, wants to raise, and I understand she, she made some comments during a, a committee hearing. Uh, we will want to hear what it is that the Commissioner feels that the service has fallen short in, uh, and we'll be happy to, to talk with the, the service about how those needs can be met if there is some shortcoming. We are in no ways complacent. We don't uh, believe that we have yet reached the level of perfection which would allow us to sit back. So uh, constructive criticism uh, is something that none of us should run uh, away from. So let's see what the issues are, and let's see how we might resolve them. Mervyn Storey. Mr. Storey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following on from the First Minister's comments at the opening of topical questions, could, could he return to the issue and indicate to the House what implications he believes the Tracy judgment has on the executive business? Well, I, I noticed that one comment uh, that was made was that on the, the foot of uh, Mr. Justice Tracy's judgment, everything that's in the entry of any departmental Minister will have to be transferred to the departmental intray of the Deputy First Minister and myself. Uh, that's not a position that I think we want to find ourselves in. We have to obviously work out where the, the, the bottom line is in terms of what it is important for the executive to, to deal with. The, uh, any other executive will deal with major issues. Uh, under the basis of Mr. Justice Tracy's judgment, uh, we would have to be dealing with every funding uh, application, the division that uh, the education minister or the roads minister or the housing minister might make in terms of where they are going to have schools, hospitals, houses, roads, etc. Uh, and those are issues that we have left at a departmental level. Uh, and of course, even lower level issues would have to be decided uh, by the executive committee. So it would be a very considerable burden on the executive if we were to go down that uh, particular uh, route. Of course, we always knew, and the, the law is very clear on it, that uh, decisions which are controversial, decisions which are significant, decisions which are cross-cutting should come to the uh, executive. But we, uh, I thought we had uh, an understanding that uh, in those terms, if there was something that any of the executive members believed that fell within those categories, they should ask for those matters to be brought to the executive. And of course, it isn't just the executive will have a role in these circumstances. Not only do we now find that the, the general public through the courts would have a role, but of course this assembly has a role as well, because any 30 members can require an issue which they believe to be controversial, significant or cross-cutting to come to the executive as well. Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the First Minister for his reply. Just to tease that out a little bit further, is the First Minister then giving an indication that there are implications uh, falling on from the Tracy judgment, specifically in relation to issues of concern in education, which are very rife in the community at this minute in time, specifically around the future of the Dixon Plan and also in regards to the Common Fund and Formula? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that uh, the, the Tracy judgment uh, has any additional impact on those particular issues because I think that was something that was already uh, required under the previous judgments. And there's been several uh, judgments that have been given in and around the, the issue of the ministerial code and the requirement to bring 
material to the, the executive. Uh, the, the Tracy judgment goes, I think, beyond anything that we have had to, to date. That is uh, why I think the executive has to, to look at the issue. But clearly, whether it is a common funding uh, formula or whether it is uh, the Dixon plan, those are issues that uh, are controversial. There is no doubt about their controversy. They are also cross-cutting uh, and therefore would have to come to the executive anyway. Order, members. Order. That ends the period for topical questions. We move on to all questions to the First Minister's Office and Deputy First Minister's Office. Michaela Boy. Question one. Members getting a double dose uh, today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the executive uh, agreed uh, in 2010 that the newly appointed Attorney General, in addition to his wider constitutional and legal functions, should act as chief legal advisor to the executive and departments. It was also decided at that time that aspects of his legal advisor role could be reviewed after a period of operation. In 2012, in our capacity as joint chairman of the executive, the Deputy First Minister and I invited the Right Honourable Dame Elish Angelini, uh, who had particular relevant experience as a law officer in the devolved administration, to carry out a limited review. The review was to examine the arrangements for ministers and departments seeking and handling legal advice, and the balance between the attorney's role as a chief legal advisor to the executive and his various statutory responsibilities. Dame Elish conducted her review over the summer and autumn period last year, and her report was delivered to us within the agreed timescale in October of 2012. We have since sought the views of our main legal officers, including the Attorney General, on the report and its recommendations. We are now considering policy options arising from the report and the views of our legal officers. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that detailed response? Uh, given that the appointment of the Attorney General is for a four-year term, which will now end in 2014, what arrangements have been put in place for either the reappointment or, or of the current Attorney General or the recruitment of a new Attorney General? Well, the, the Deputy First Minister and I have already had discussions uh, about this matter. I think we have a fairly settled view, but we have procedures to go through before uh, such a, an outcome is uh, announced. So the, the procedures are under, underway and uh, we would hope within weeks to be able to make an announcement. Basil McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, First Minister, given that the Attorney-General questioned the legitimacy of the challenge that we've been talking about to Justice Tracy and actually felt that there was no need to bring it to the Executive, is this um, some sort of schism between the Executive and the High Court? I don't think that there is uh, any schism between the, the executive and the, the high court. Uh, the, the executive and this assembly have to act within the, the law. Uh, that is a requirement that uh, is placed upon us all. Uh, the law, of course, as uh, the member will know, is often open to interpretation. I suspect uh, another judge on another day might have given a different view on some of the issues that are contained in the, the Tracy judgment. Uh, such is the, the legal system. That's why barristers have grown so rich in the, the, the past. Uh, the, the reality, of course, uh, for us is that we have to deal with the judgments as they come down, and the executive, of course, will comply with any judgment from the courts. Alec Atwood. Mr Atwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, given the inclination of the current Attorney-General uh, to join in Supreme Court cases, European Court cases, and indeed uh, cases involving the lead scandalising of a judge, do you think, in retrospect, and given the review that you referred to, do you think that the uh, role given to the Attorney General by the Executive in July 2010 was too generous and now needs to be constrained? Well, I think the, the member puts his finger on one of the, the key issues. There is the uh, difficulty with, at one and the same time, the Attorney General being the adviser to the Executive and on the other hand, having the role independently, because his independent role has on occasions uh, required him to act in taking actions against the executive. We will not deal with what the outcome of that may ha have been, uh, but it, it clearly is one of the issues that uh, Dame uh, Elish has looked at, which we are looking at, and which will form part uh, of any proposals that we bring to executive colleagues. Mr. Story. Mr. Story. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, our international engagement has uh, initiated a number of potential opportunities that we hope to announce over the coming months. More generally, our direct intervention has helped open new trade markets for local companies in China and secure the participation of a number of Chinese companies in the hugely successful investment conference last week. We were also delighted to see that our meetings in China with key stakeholders have resulted in the expansion of the Confucius Institute to uh, a number of classrooms throughout Northern Ireland. We continue to engage with officials from the Chinese government on a number of projects, and as was publicly revealed last Thursday, the executive is advancing plans to establish a new office in the Chinese capital of Beijing. We hope to be in a position to provide more details on this in due course. Our visit to New York last month provided an opportunity to strengthen relationships with existing investors and to seek to begin new relations with potential ones. We also extended an invitation to the investment conference last week to a wide range of business executives. Our visits to North America over a number of years have produced real and tangible benefits. We have consolidated relationships with some globally recognized brand names, including, for example, Universal Studios and HBO, who continue to invest in the Paint Hall and the Titanic Studios in Belfast. More specifically, Mr. Speaker, our meetings with the senior board of United Airlines directly helped to address its concerns over UK air passenger duty in Belfast. In securing the devolution of air passenger duty to the Assembly, we helped maintain the long-term commitment of United to its hugely important transatlantic flight. It is the only direct route from Belfast to the US and is of significant strategic importance to us, uh, realizing our FDI potential. Our meetings with the top management team in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and senior executives of Cairn International Minister, Limited on gone. the back of much hard work by officials in Invest Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Washington Bureau culminated in both companies committing significant investment packages in Northern Ireland. Merman Story. Mr. Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for detailed reply. And obviously, my own constituency sees the outworkings of some of the benefit of that, given the ongoing filming that's taking place in places like Ballantoy and the Dark Hedges. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is following the lead of the executive and, and going to China, indeed in China this week. So, could he indicate to the House what future investment trips? the executive are planning to expand on the success already achieved? Well, in terms of the executive as a, a whole, uh, I know that uh, the Deti Minister has just returned from South uh, Africa uh, with a very successful trip there. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I next week are in Boston and Chicago, uh, and in December we are in Japan. Jim Allister. I'm sure the First Minister sees himself as First Minister of all of Northern Ireland. Uh, with that in mind, has he any concerns that in the, in the last year, 2012-13, that 80 per cent of the FDI visits were only to the Belfast constituencies in Northern Ireland, uh, and 54, for example, to East Belfast and a mere four to North Antrim? How does the First Minister see a more level playing field for foreign and direct investment across Northern Ireland? Well, I'm glad some of the, the jobs announcements, for instance, over the, the last number of days uh, have been west of the, the ban. Uh, the uh, two announcements uh, in uh, OMA. Uh, and I know that uh, when we had the round table meeting with the, uh, the Prime Minister and a number of potential investors, I had people both on my right and my left that were talking about uh, bringing jobs uh, again to the Londonderry uh, area. So you know, there is an attempt being made by Invest Northern Ireland to, to spread them, but uh, this is private sector uh, employers. These are people, businesses, who will take their own decisions based on a lot of logistical issues as to where it is best for them to, to be. Uh, a lot of them, uh, because we are dealing with uh, financial and business services, uh, are gravitating towards uh, the, the Belfast area, and that's unquestionably the, the, the case. Uh, that is one of the issues that uh, has led the executive to look at issues, for instance, as to where public sector jobs, which uh, are perhaps more mobile, uh, should be situated. Uh, but uh, you know, there is no reluctance on the part of Invest Northern Ireland to encourage uh, businesses to go to where the people are, because ultimately the labour force is an essential part. If the skills are there and the people are there, if the rest of the logistics uh, are in place, 
then uh, it is a much more credible case for Invest Northern Ireland to put forward. Uh, Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his answers thus far in relation to the Economic Conference. I totally agree with that the jobs announced for Roma for Teletex and Powerscreen Terex were very welcome last week. Given that the, uh, the Canadian Commissioner to London has recently said that direct flights from Belfast to Canada are crucial, and given that Bombardier has announced increased jobs, what prospects are there likely to be for having those direct flights reinstalled? Mr. Speaker, ultimately, those are matters for the airlines and the, the airports to, to, to deal with. And uh, where we're asked to, to speak uh, to uh, an airline company, we have done so. Uh, I know the Deputy Minister has spoken to uh, airlines in, the, in North America. The Deputy First Minister and I uh, spoke to uh, airlines in trips to the, the Middle East. Uh, all of those we will continue to do, but ultimately the, the package has to be put together by the, the airport to bring them in, and the airline has to be satisfied that the customer base is going to be there uh, for that purpose. Uh, like him, uh, I'm delighted with the announcement made by Bombardier, uh, announcing another 250 jobs, uh, and those are our skilled jobs, so it's uh, first class in terms of getting jobs which go be beyond the uh, income medium. Uh, as far as Bombardier is concerned, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I in a recent visit to Montreal, uh, visited the Bombardier company and met many of the people from Northern Ireland who are working out there. When I was speaking to Pierre Bourdouin, the uh, chief executive of uh, Bombardier, just during the, the conference, he was indicating that there is a, a real desire on the part of people from Northern Ireland who have gone to Canada to come back to Northern Ireland now that the jobs are in Northern Ireland. I think you'll see that trend occurring much more uh, over the coming days. The Crumlin Road Jail has proved to be a significant success, attracting some 85,000 visitors in less than a year. The next phase of the development is a boutique distillery and restaurant, and work will start on this project later this year. We continue to consider options for other parts of the jail, including B Wing. D Wing and the Warden's Cottages. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the jail's development and its success in creating local employment opportunities and enhancing community confidence is a practical example of the Executive's commitment to the regeneration of North Belfast. Rosalind McCurley. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, can the Minister um, outline, in terms of job creation, what opportunities will there be for young people from deprived areas? Mr. Speaker, as I understand it, uh, there is already a close relationship between the community organisations in the area uh, and the management of the, the, the jail regeneration. Uh, I think there are regular meetings taking place. Uh, I think about 30 jobs have been created in terms of the, the tours and the conference uh, element of the jail. There is a potential, I believe, for about 60 jobs in relation to the boutique distillery. Uh, all of those jobs, I think, are capable of being filled by local people. Uh, obviously, employers will remember employment law and do it on the basis of, of merit, uh, but I, I suspect that there are jobs that uh, will easily fit the, the uh, uh, abilities of people in the local community. Uh, Mike Nasbitt, Mr. Nasbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I, I thank the First Minister. Given the, the successes that, that he celebrates in terms of the jail, uh, does he have any regrets, personal or professional, over the sale of the courthouse for a pint? The sale of the courthouse. Well, the, the two are connected underground. Uh, and one could see a, a very strong case being made as to how it could have been combined into one project. Uh, for that reason, I understand that there, there is a, a group, uh, a task force presently looking at the issue of what might be done to regenerate the, uh, the, the courthouse. Um, I believe that DSD officials and others are looking into that, uh, that issue. Uh, it will require a major investment for work to be carried out there. I suspect that the longer it is left derelict, the costlier it will become. Uh, but it is owned by the private sector, albeit uh, at uh, what one might describe as a giveaway uh, price. 
Uh, however, it's not something that I was involved in, uh, I have to say, and, and therefore can't comment on uh, how sensible that sale was. I would comment on it if it ends up being sold back to the uh, executive at something that's uh, much higher. Jimmy Spratt, Mr. Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask him uh, to, uh, what, what his evaluation of the success of Crumlin Road Courthouse has been uh, in his first year of operation uh, in the North Belfast area? Well, I, I visited the, the, uh, the jail on several uh, occasions uh, at conferences uh, and at uh, events, for instance, Game of Thrones held an event uh, down there. Uh, and people who were not from the Northern Ireland uh, region uh, were going round the, the jail and uh, were blown away at the potential that there was there. Uh, as I indicated in the, the initial answer, 85,000 people uh, have gone through the, uh, the, the jail uh, during its time as a tourist attraction, probably many more before that. Uh, and uh, I think that indicates that we are probably ahead of the target. I think we had a target of 90,000 in the first year, uh, 85,000 with uh, two months to go. I think we will exceed the target, and I think those numbers speak for themselves. Alvin McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, could I welcome the First Minister's very supportive uh, views in relation to the jail. In fact, I've seen him many times in the jail uh, myself. Uh, <laughs> But does, does the minister, uh, does the first minister, uh, believe that enough effort has been put in to publicising this uh, tourist uh, 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 project, and really, uh, would the first minister give further backing uh, to trying to uh, give it more profile? Well, clearly, with the statistics that I outlined, uh, they have been meeting the, the, the targets, and, and therefore. Uh, must be doing something right in all of this. Indeed, I, I was rather shocked when one of my special advisors told me that uh, Crumlin Rule Jail is the number one tourist destination on TripAdvisor. Uh, now, that even goes uh, with a, a list that included Titanic Belfast. So I, I don't know whether that says something about the people who use TripAdvisor uh, or not, but uh, it indicates that uh, there is a, a very large number of people who feel that it is a good attraction and worth going to, to see. Uh, and I hope that by this question, uh, we'll get some coverage that will give it some additional advertising space. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Question number four, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. The current 10-year strategy <clears throat> will continue until 2016 work to further the aims of the strategy is now being taken forward through the Delivering Social Change Framework. That's seeking to address the linked issues of poverty and improving children's lives. Through that Delivering Social Change, we are moving away from uh, long lists of existing activities towards smaller numbers of cross-cutting and more strategic objectives. These are additional to the existing work that's going across government. In support of this development, the Children and Young Persons Early Actions document published 14th of November 2012 takes full account of the principles of the 10-year strategy for children and young people, including the high-level outcomes. It identifies the key priorities for children and families over the remaining years of the 10-year strategy. The Early Action document identifies five priority work programs and has been developed to assist the key stakeholders in delivering future programs and initiatives. <clears throat> Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Deputy Minister, uh, sorry, the Junior Minister for his uh, answer. Could I ask him to outline the five priorities in the new action plan? Well, I, I can uh, go, go through each um, of, of the priorities in turn. Um, I mean, the critical thing for us is improving each of the improving children's lives uh, directly themselves. 
Um, what we're looking at is improving children's educational outcome. It's improving their health. And what we're looking at on a broader sense is ensuring that children uh, have the best opportunity themselves to raise themselves out of poverty. To give you one example of that, because I, I mean, in two minutes I can't break down uh, each of the five and go into them in the detail uh, that's there. But one of the things we do know of is that uh, children with, with five good GCSEs, and you'd appreciate this uh, as a teacher, can raise themselves and in many cases raise their families out of poverty. So one of the most strategic actions that, that has been taken um, and that we have taken has been to ensure that children who are sitting on a D are sitting on an E in terms of, of literacy and in terms of numeracy can get that additional support that can translate them up to a position where they've got a GCSE pass and thereby go where the educational evidence is leading and that is to take them into a future that allows them a sustainable job with a reasonable uh, amount of pay. Now, the, the, that, in essence, and we, I understand that we have somewhere in the region of 250 plus new teachers, additional teachers, coming in to support children, uh, and we'll have those in place uh, by December. That, in essence, encapsulates uh, the uh, delivering uh, social change uh, in gone. terms of what, we, what we're doing. I could talk about transitions, I could talk about integrated delivery, I could talk about joined up planning and commission, but we can have those conversations at a later stage. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank um, the junior minister for his very detailed answer. And in fact, he's not getting a chance to expand on what he was just talking about. And can he just expand again on the, on the, on the actions that have been taken on the children and young people under the Delivering Social Change project? Well, you've got early years and you've got early intervention. You've got literacy and numeracy. You've got the transitions. You've got the need for an integrated delivery. And you've got the need for joined up planning and commissioning. The most significant of those uh, in recent days was the OFM-DFM launch of the Bright Start, which was the executive's project uh, to deliver affordable and integrated childcare. It set out the broad direction for childcare strategy and aimed through 15 first key first actions that the main priorities that were identified during the research. Now, the importance of that is OFM, DFM, this is a £10 million investment directly in the early years and into childcare. And that is the bright start. What does that mean? That means hundreds of jobs being created through social enterprises. It means hundreds of jobs being made available for work within the childcare sector, hundreds of jobs being created. That looks to 8,000 of our young people to have a, a, either a new uh, or an existing affordable childcare place. And when I say uh, new, the vast majority of those 8,000 childcare places uh, will be uh, new places. Some 7,000 plus will be new cases. That will allow many parents to re-engage with the employment market. It will allow many of the children, because we have also looked at the quality of the childcare, to get that hand up as they proceed uh, into uh, their future education. The Bright Start is probably, uh, in my view, one of the most exciting initiatives that we have done and is cutting edge in terms of leading the way in social enterprise and childcare practice. Uh, Danny Kenahan, Mr. Kenahan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know two people have asked a question of the Minister, and we've got very little detail uh, of what this policy is actually going to do in improving education and health of children or parents re engaging. Could we have more detail on not just on Bright Start, but how things are going to work over the next 10 years to actually help um, our children? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the level of detail uh, that I specifically uh, went into uh, and is, is a fair reflection in terms of the question uh, that was asked. Because delivering social change focused upon where the needs actually were. And I've given two specific examples, the first one being in terms of literacy and numeracy, following what we were told was, was to ensure that children had the foundations in literacy and numeracy in primary school, 
and then ensuring that those children got the opportunity at GCSE level to obtain a pass, which in effect would be a passport for them into a better educational future. The second key point uh, which we, uh, I've outlined was on the issue of childcare. And if anybody says that, you know, given the financial detail of £10 million, creating the hundreds of extra jobs, allowing critically uh, for social enterprises to look towards how those childcare places could be facilitated, specifically in terms of allowing flexibility, ensuring affordability, and uh, thirdly, uh, ensuring that the placements of them are in areas where families can directly access. Those are detail of new policies which are directed to meet the need that the research base is showing us and that friends and families who are in direct need of childcare uh, are asking us to provide. Now, uh, 7,000 opportunities for new childcare is a level of detail that we haven't had before and it's a very new and exciting initiative that brings the whole delivering social change framework to a pinnacle. Katrina Ryan. Question number five, Kesht Ivera Kuig Ledahal. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister John Bell to answer this question. As outlined in Together Building a United Community, we are committed to publishing a sexual orientation strategy. A consultation document that will inform public consultation on the strategy is currently under consideration in the department. That strategy will be published once the consultation process uh, has been completed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I note the First Minister didn't answer the supplementary question posed by my colleague Ian Milne and also his attempt to divert away from the key issue of equality in relation to the gay community. I wonder would the junior minister um, share with us why the DUP is so resistant, um, given the delays that we've had in the bringing forward of this strategy, why they're so resistant to rights for uh, the gay community? I think that uh, the, member, the premise of the member's question is somewhat significantly flawed because she's asking questions of the office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And the last time I looked, the Deputy First Minister was from your own political party. You weren't asking questions of the Democratic Unionist Party. Let me be very clear to you. The office of the First and Deputy First Minister is committed to respecting the human dignity and worth of every one of our citizens. Michael M. Jimsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the, the uh, junior minister, in the light of, his, of his, uh, that answer, how he feels that this fits with a, an executive with 11 departments of state, 11 permanent secretaries heading up those departments, and all of them male, not a single female amongst them? Well, I, I mean, can look to, in particular, my own colleague, uh, Arlene Foster, who has done uh, an outstanding job uh, in the role uh, that has been taken forward. I think uh, uh, her work and that of the work of the First and Deputy First Minister uh, in recent times uh, and the profile that uh, the Deputy Minister has uh, taken forward just shows what can be achieved in Northern Ireland when uh, we work together. I mean, we're looking at, in recent times, uh, over 2,000, somewhere in the region of 2,000 new jobs uh, have been created in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Listening carefully, uh, to, without breaking any commercial confidentiality, with what the Deputy Minister has said, what the First Minister has also said, is that there are many companies, and the confidence is there that in addition to those 2,000 jobs, we could be looking at hundreds, and we're confidently looking at hundreds going into thousands of uh, new jobs being created. I mean, of course, the obvious uh, point from the Minister is, in terms of the number of departments, uh, it is a question of physician heal thyself, because the number of departments were created by your party. Yeah. And at that particular time, and the record is particularly clear, the Democratic Unionist Party looked towards more efficient government. But it was your party uh, that created it. And uh, in, in terms of 
Uh, your party, if you could tell me who your female minister was. Um, uh, it, oh, that's right, you didn't have one, is that right? Okay, and, uh, and in this current position, uh, you still don't have a female minister. So in that question, it really is a quick question, sir, of physician heal thyself. Questions to the first